mind and my heart along with that to live not for myself but yet for God somebody said do you know what you are getting yourself into when I finally ironed out all of my priorities and ask God to remove the doubt that makes me so unsure of these things I ask myself I ask myself, do you know what you are getting yourself into? I'm getting into you because you got to me in a way words can't describe. I'm getting into you because I got to be your essential to survive. I'm going to love you with my life. When he looked at me and said, I kind of view you as a son, and for a second our eyes met, and I met that with a question, do you know what you are getting yourself into? I'm getting into you, because you got to me, in a way we can't describe. Cause I got to be your essential to survive I'm gonna love you with my life Been a liar and I'll never amount to The kind of person you deserve to worship you You say you will not dwell on what I did But what I do, you said I love you and that's what you are getting yourself into Getting into you because you got to me in a way words can't describe. I'm getting into you because I got to be your essential to survive. I'm gonna love you with my life. I'm getting into you because you got to me in a way words can't describe. Getting into you because I've got to be your essential to survive. I'm gonna love you with my life. He said, I love you, and that's what you are getting yourself into. Good morning. As people are coming in, uh, be sure and welcome everyone. Uh, if you're new with us, uh, I want to encourage you to grab a Sunday sheet today. There are some uh, kind of at the back, also at the information desk out in the lobby. And I encourage you to grab that. On the back of that at the bottom is a feedback form. And if you wouldn't mind just uh, putting your name on there, maybe your contact info, if uh, there's a way you want us to contact you. And let us know if it's your first time or your 13th time here. And, uh, but one thing this will do is this means you'll be invited to our beginnings class. And that happens next Sunday. Uh, we do that on the first Sundays of the month is a beginnings class just to help you understand a little bit about this church and what's going on and how do you get connected around here and what is it that we're about. And so uh, if you are new around here, we encourage you to join us next Sunday at 930 during the class hour at beginnings class. One of the big things we're doing this summer is backyard Bible. And so also on the back of your Sunday sheet are the five locations uh, are all around the city where we'll be doing backyard Bible. And so this Wednesday night, uh, we will not be having class at the building, but instead we'll be doing some inviting and preparing at these five locations. And you're welcome to go to the one near you. And even if you haven't signed up yet, you can just show up and say, hey, I'm here to help. I'll help clean up or be a bouncer or just be on Cool Patrol. Either way, that's all right. Now, that was funny, Cool Patrol. Okay. 
You didn't have to laugh, but thank you. All right, so I hope everyone will be a part of uh, Backyard Bible. And the next two weeks we'll be preparing and inviting, and then it'll be the week of Backyard Bible. So be sure and check out those locations. It's on the back of your Sunday sheet. And now let's stand together as we worship and as people come in and join us. Let your kingdom come here. Let your will be done here in us. Jesus, there is no one greater. You alone are Savior. Show the world your love. King of heaven, come down. King 
of heaven come now let your glory reign shining like the day king of heaven come king of heaven rise up who can stand against us you are strong to save in your mighty name king of heaven come Children of your mercy, rescued for your glory, we cry, Jesus, set our hearts towards you, that every eye would see. your glory reign shining like the day king of heaven come king of heaven rise up who can stand against us you are strong to save in your mighty name king of heaven come One thing remains. 
remains this one thing remains your love never fails it never gives up it never runs out on me your love never fails it never gives up it never runs out on me your love never fails it never gives up it never runs out on me your love in death in life i'm confident and covered by the power of your great love my debt is paid there's nothing that can separate my heart from your great love is your love never fails and never gives up it never runs out on me sing it out your love never fails it never gives up it never runs out on me your love never fails it never gives up it never runs out on me your love Just it. 
day when my strength is failing the end draws near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending all you have ten thousand years and then forever going to enter into a time of communion. If you need prayer, the prayer teams are going to be around the auditorium. You can go and uh, get with them. They'll pray with you. Um, But for now, um, pray with me for communion. Dear God, thank you for this day and for this day of worship, for all the people that come together just to praise you. We just ask that you bless this time of fellowship, not only fellowship with each other, but fellowship with you. Just bless the bread and the and the juice that we're about to take that's symbolizing the sacrifice that you made. And just help us to um, glow, grow closer to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. You can go to the tables. Savior, glorious.
is Lord, Emmanuel, God is with us, blessed Redeemer, Father, if ever there was a time to love you, now is the time, and we always is the time. And Father, we declare that Jesus is our Lord, and Father, as we naturally go this week, we pray that you will provide this super and make it a supernatural experience. May we be lights to the world. May we be your light to the world. And may we glorify you in everything that we do. And it's your son's name that we pray. Amen. I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning with verse 9. I'm going to ask you to do something we don't do very often, but... uh, It's a heavy topic for some of us this morning. I want to ask you to stand as we read God's word. We stand in submission to him and his word today. 
not to anything I may say or accidentally say. It's okay, you can laugh. 1 Corinthians 6, middle of verse 9. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say food for the stomach and the stomach for food, yet God will destroy both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the member of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? (laughs) Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. So, flee. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you receive from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Holy Father, as we come before your holy word, may you holify us, sanctify us, set us apart from the culture in which we live, that we might be transformed into the likeness of Jesus and that as we represent him in this world, that our culture might be transformed, that this might be a place where all that you intended for humans to be and to do can be experienced. Make us whole. Take our brokenness, sexual and otherwise, and make us whole. Something that can only be done by the power of your spirit. Him we pray and him we ask to speak to us now. Amen. Be seated, please. Sex sells. In 2010, the website sex.com sold for $12 million. More than hotels.com, beer.com, or toys.com. Our culture has cheapened one of God's most creative gifts with sexual innuendo selling everything from cars to car insurance, from direct TV to Dove chocolate. Provocative dress is now the norm and restraint is abnormal. You don't have to watch TV or surf the internet very long to find that what used to be considered pornography is now marketing 101. There are a few lines that we won't cross or at least be entertained while others do. Sexuality has become so embedded in the culture and so embedded in the human identity according to our culture that to question one's sexual expression is discrimination and to suggest restraint is just foolish and naive. 
It's not a stretch to say that we have turned sexual expression into the ultimate self-expression. Nor do I think is it much of a leap from there to legitimizing any self-gratifying sexual practice. While many Christians and Christian institutions have continued to uphold biblical teaching on sex, that hasn't always translated to our practice. Studies have shown that the divorce rate among Christians only slightly lags behind the divorce rate in the culture at large. Teens take pledges to be sexually abstinent. This has been popular for the last couple of decades in youth ministries across the country. And in fact, teens who take pledges for sexual purity, it does make a difference. They actually delay sex by 18 months. In a recent survey on ChristianMingle.com, 63% that's more than 6 out of 10, 63% of respondents ages 18 to 59 said that they would have sex before marriage. ChristianMingle.com, 63%. Need I go on for us to agree that Corinth has affected us? I could talk about porn use among Christians or sex abuse in the clergy. You name it, it's out there. Our surrounding culture is shaping us. This new reality recently led one California pastor to coin the phrase sexually, sexual atheism to explain the gap between the teaching of Scripture and the practice of many Christians. You have to wonder if we haven't done what the ancients did. We've basically separated what we believe about the body from what we believe about the spirit. The ancients believed in this kind of dualism when it came to body and spirit. It took on different forms and different philosophies, and you can read about these in history and culture books, but generally speaking, they believed that the body and spirit were somehow separated, not integrated. On one hand, some would suggest that the body was a prison holding back the spirit, and so it needed uh, to be ignored or indulged. Others suggested that the body was evil and must be tamed by the spirit or pushed down in submission and deprived of God-created things. Some believed that the spirit would outlive the body, which we believe that we think, don't we? But in fact, what they did was They said the body doesn't matter because the spirit outlives it. And so they ignored ethics that that dealt with the body only for that of the spirit. These kind of dualistic beliefs mixed with a progressive culture on the outside, be it Corinth or Oklahoma City, are perfectly, or make the perfect recipe for an environment of unlimited sexual expression. In fact, the ancients had a term for unlimited sexual expression. Do you know what that term was? Corinthianize. Corinthianize. We might say fraternize or some other word like that. They would say Corinthianize. When I compare the reality on the ground in Corinth or here with 1 Corinthians chapter 6, there's one thing that stands out to me over everything else. And it isn't a rule about sex or a line you can or cannot cross. You know what stands out to me the most about 1 Corinthians chapter 6 is that our view of humans and the human body, and thereby sexuality, is way too low. When you read 1 Corinthians chapters 5, 6, and 7, you find out that God has a very high view of human sexuality and the human body. And it's capped off in chapter 6, verse 19, where Paul says this, you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. There's the sermon right there. Everything you need to know about sex or anything else that has to do with your body, the answer is right there. As we stand and as we sing. That's what we used to say back in the day when the preacher was done. I'm not done, I'm sorry. Because I want to talk about this. How you get there. You see, what Paul does from verse 12 up into this verse is he does something very powerful that you and I need to get our minds around before we ever ask a question about sex or any other topic. 
You see, this passage makes it clear that we are not our own. That we have a new master. He, we are now slave to a new master. A master who created us and wants us to really live. It is in submission to this new master that we experience full and free lives. As Paul makes his way from verse 12 to verse 19 and 20, what you could discover today about your body, about the body of Christ, could be the very thing that helps you answer those questions, that helps you put the past behind you. It could be the very thing that helps you abstain from that which stains you as you honor God with your body. Here's the first thing that that enlightens this higher view of our bodies and sex than I think our culture has, and that is this. You are more than your desires. You are more than your desires. Paul says, I have the right to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. These first statements in verse 12 may be slogans or cliches that were batted around either in Corinth or inside the church in Corinth. For all we know about Corinthian culture, we could certainly imagine a t-shirt that might say this. Actually, that says, everything is possible for me. Quick aside here, if you're reading the NIV, the New International Version of the Bible, and you just saw that I was reading the NIV, and it was a different phrase, that's because there's a new NIV that was put out in 2011. That's the one I use most of the time, in case you were wondering. That's the one that's in our pews uh, every morning for our guests to use. So the 2011 version says, I have the right to do anything. The, the older version of the new international version said, everything is permissible for me. It's probably a little bit more literal, but they both capture the same idea. And I like this newer one. You know Why? Because I think that's a t-shirt I've seen. I think that's a t-shirt or a slogan I've probably worn at some point in my life. Especially in this country, in this culture. I have the right to do anything I want. Paul says, yes, but I will not be mastered by anything. Sometimes we believe that what we have the right to do or what comes natural to us, we have the right to do. Well, we could follow that line of thinking for just a moment, but think about this. Scott Peck, in his book, The Road Less Traveled, reminds us that it is also natural to defecate in our pants and never brush our teeth. You were worried about me talking about sex, weren't you? But he continues, Yet we teach ourselves to do the unnatural until the unnatural itself becomes second nature. In other words, yes, a lot of the things that that God calls us to do, a lot of things that we are created to do and be and become are not natural. That's why we need the, thank you for that prayer, the supernatural help of the Holy Spirit to become what we're meant to become. And so sometimes it is the natural that has to be sacrificed. Sometimes we have to practice the unnatural until the unnatural itself becomes second nature. Indeed, says Peck. All self-discipline might be defined as teaching ourselves to do the unnatural. Natural is no excuse for abandoning what is best. And Paul takes this a step further, thinking about what is best, as he exposes the real issue. The real issue for those of us who have been washed and sanctified and justified is this. What masters you? What masters you? What is your master? Paul says, I will not be mastered by anything. Many people speak of desire as if it's something that cannot be mastered. We speak as if we must settle for submission to drives and desires and urges and wants. We we speak as if we must settle for for submission to them as our master. This is not what God wants for you or for me in any category of our lives. A young man came into a pastor's office claiming that he just couldn't stop his pattern of having sex with women. In fact, multiple women, different women. He knew it was wrong, he said, but the sexual drive is just way too strong. It's just inevitable. In fact, he even blamed God 
for creating him that way. The pastor, as he was listening, said to the men, suppose I came into your room and caught you and one of your girlfriends as you were just starting this inevitable process. Suppose that I walked in, and I didn't stop you, but I took out 10 $100 bills, laid them beside you, and told you that they were yours if you stopped what would you do? Well, the young man quickly admitted that he would, in fact, stop and take the cash. To which his pastor replied, so what happened to the irresistible force of lust? Thought you said you couldn't stop. Thought that passion couldn't be controlled. You see, one passion may, in fact, seem irresistible. For money, for power, for sex, for identity, for value, all of these passions that can be that are created by God and can be good, they may seem irresistible until a greater passion comes along. And while our surrounding culture is mastered by natural desires, God offers something greater. He wants to transform us so that we're not just enslaved to to just uh, to, to our desires. That we're not defined by what our culture says is the norm. You see, we are more than a bag of uncontrollable urges and desires. We are bodies created to be whole and satisfied in him to glorify him. Pick back up in verse 13. You say the food for the stomach and the stomach for food, but yet God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. You see, it's not just about this urge. You are more than urges and desires and wants. You're a body, a whole, integrated, created body that is for the Lord. Verse 14, by his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Our body is part of the whole of who we are. Our spirit is not going to outlive our body. Our, li- our bodies will be transformed now and in eternity, and we will remain a one whole being if we live in submission to that one master. Like Jesus, your broken body becomes your transformed body. And both your body and spirit are raised up to live with God for eternity. Your body is meant for the Lord. It's how you glorify him now and for all eternity. You see, you are more than your desires. You are a body with a purpose. You are a whole. Interesting, the word Paul uses here is not the word flesh, which he uses when he talks about that that sense of our physical being that betrays us and that, that tends toward evil, the flesh, the sarks. He uses a different word. It's the word soma. It's the word for the whole person. It is a word for body, but as the Jews believed, it's heart, soul, mind, and strength, all as one. When he's speaking of body, he's speaking of an integrated whole. And you have purpose in that body, in that being, because you are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, Honor God with your body. You see, the way we see the human body and the human being is at a far higher level than what the world sees. God says that you are more than desires. You are a body. And you know what? You're more than a body. In fact, you are much more than just a body. Verse 15, don't you know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? The word members here is the word not for membership in an organization. It is literally the word for an arm or a leg, some appendage, some part of your body. You, when you are being in your body, there is more going on than chemical reactions in the physical realm. When you are being in your body, if you are in Christ, then you are a member, you are a body part of Jesus himself. We become the living, breathing, active presence of Christ in our time and our space. That means what we do in our bodies matters even more. 
Because our body becomes the medium where our desires submit themselves to God. Our body becomes the medium where, where truth and reality are lived out in front of the world. A culture, a world of a culture that has rejected all things Christ. Thus, the warning in verse 15. Shall I take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said the two will become one flesh, but whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. You are one with Christ. Why would you want to unite your body physically or spiritually with any other? Now this little move Paul makes here is a little bit confusing because you're like, okay, is he talking about sex or prostitution or marriage or union between him and us. It's kind of one of those moments like he does in Ephesians chapter 5 when he talks about marriage and church and kind of does them back and forth. I call it killing two birds with one stone. Might be killing three birds with one stone here. But here's the point. In Corinth, there probably was prostitution going on. Well, not probably, there was. It went on in the religious places. It went on at the, the pagan temples. And it's very likely that Christians coming into Christ had a hard time giving up that practice, right? I mean, after all, a sexual experience is pretty well ingrained in our brains and our bodies, and it's hard to just go cold turkey. So you can imagine that that was still a temptation in a Corinthian culture, especially a Corinthian culture, as we've already said, where they're merging the two. We heard already of, in chapter 5 about someone who was doing uh, sexual practices that even the pagans wouldn't accept. So we know there was struggle and trouble in this category, just like it is in our time. Uh, so, but I don't think it's just prostitution that Paul's addressing here, although he gets that one while he's going along. I think he's talking about this idea of how we view our body. And he uses this analogy of prostitution that most of us would go, ooh, yuck, gross. And he's hoping most of the Christians at Corinth would go, ooh, yuck, gross, to say, well, then why would we prostitute ourselves to the culture? You know that two become one flesh. You know that anyone who you have been with in that way, that they're not just dismissed from your brain or your body. Some of you... Some of you carry that kind of pain with you every day. Maybe you feel guilt. Because you've had multiple sexual experiences and you realize when it says the two become one, you realize how painful that is. Some of you have even been a victim of sexual sin. You've been a victim and, and that stays with you because at some level in our mind, and our body, that's where God designed sex to work and to make sense and to be really powerful and it gets warped and tainted and ruined. And we carry that with us. We know the two become one. And those of you who haven't had that experience, or maybe have and still, you now are in a, a married relationship, and you now understand what the two become one is supposed to mean. We get that, we get that. But Paul's not just talking about sex here. He's talking about how God views our body. You're more than your desires. You're more than a body. You are the body of Christ. You have become one with Christ. You are more than just a body. The extent to which Christ walks this planet is the extent to which you follow him and are united with him in this reality. So the verse goes on. Free, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against his own body. Because you are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. But he goes further. This view that God has of you and your body and your sexuality, is, it's, it's far greater than what our culture would lead you to believe. It's far greater than what we've settled for because we are more than our desires. We are more than a body. And in fact, we are more than members of Christ's body. He goes on to say that you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received 
from God. That Holy Spirit, the one we talked about last week that teaches us new ways of thinking, that discerns foolishness, that makes right judgments, that gives us the mind of Christ, that Holy Spirit takes up residence in you. We're not just some weird existential representation of Jesus, although we are that. We're not just the image of Christ. I mean, we're, we're not Jesus himself. We don't take on his DNA. We're not uh, really, we, we, if you're walking around saying that you're Jesus the Messiah, we got somebody who needs to talk to you. Okay, you've heard of crazy people doing that. We're not saying that we are Jesus. We represent him. But even greater than that, the Holy Spirit is in us. That is a step beyond being the Christ in a body. In an ancient temple, you would go to find a place of worship. And it was believed in these ancient temples that you could meet a deity there. The gods and goddesses of the pagans came to the temples and you, you, you met there. But your God's temple is not up on a mountaintop. And he is not contained in some elaborate building full of gold and stones and jewels. No, his place is right here inside of you. In you. You're more than the body of Christ. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. He has taken up residence in you. And you would never put two deities in the same temple. In the same way, there's no space in your temple for another deity. God is there. There is no room for rivals. The same is true with your body. It is no place for a second loyalty not defined by your appetites, not defined by your impulses, not defined by your culture. You will not be mastered by anything except the one who paid the price for you. Because you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. That's it. That's the answer. Whatever your question is, that's the answer. And as you listen with one ear to your culture and the other to Christ, do you sometimes feel like, well, God's just holding out on you? He's trying to keep something from you? Sometimes that's the way that we look on sex or other issues like it. That somehow God has created something and then he's pulled back. He's holding it away from us. I tell you, this passage tells me that he's not. He simply wants you to be everything that you're capable of being. He doesn't want you to be mastered by any one thing. He doesn't want you to separate out parts of your existence and let them become your whole identity, sexual or otherwise. We could be talking about any of those categories back in verse <clears throat> uh, 9 and 10. We could go around the room and point out those categories, and every one of us, couldn't we? But that's not what he wants for us. God knows what he created humans to be. And he wants us to be whole and to live real lives. And he gave us bodies capable of doing that. He gave us bodies that when we bring them in submission to Christ, then we experience transformation. And we become more than our desires. We become more than a representation of Christ. We become more than a temple of the Holy Spirit. We become his possession. We become the very people that he created us to become. Why in the world, why in the world would we settle for anything less? Would you stand with me as we close in prayer? topic wasn't just about sex, was it? It's about how we live in this body, in this world. How do we live in Christ in Corinth? How do we live in Christ in Oklahoma City? You can bring me whatever questions you want to bring me about any form of sexuality or anything else on these lists. You can write me an email. We can blog about it. We can talk about it. We can argue. We might even disagree at the end of the day about some of these things. But this passage, can we put that passage back up there? This passage is where we start. Whether we're talking about money, sex, 
power, anything that tempts to indulge us in this world, we're not our own. We've been bought at the highest price that was ever paid. Therefore, we honor God with our body. Sing this prayer. Jesus, that's hard to sing and really mean it. We want to see it. It's a slogan we want to wear. We want everybody to believe it. But it's hard to do. We still want to be Lord of our own lives. We still turn to the powers of this world and submit to them. But today we declare once again, we declare anew that we are not ours. We are yours. Jesus is my Lord Jesus is my Lord and he rules my life Jesus is my Lord keep your head bowed keep your head bowed and pray right now there is a battle inside you between lords there are lords battling over you and your body right now. Your soma, your entire identity, heart, soul, mind, and strength. There is a battle going on. It may be sexual. It may be some other kind. But you have declared Jesus as your Lord. If you're here this morning and you've never declared him as your Lord, and he's not, that's okay. But we'll help that to happen today. You can pray to him right now. You can declare him your Lord. And today, you could be baptized into him, in Christ where you're washed, you're sanctified, you're justified. This could be the day for you to do that. As we end this song, I invite you down front. We'd love to talk to you about that, pray with you, and help that to happen. But can you really say right now that Jesus is your Lord? Jesus, expose that which is Lord over us right now. As we bow and we pray, Holy Spirit, expose it to us right now across this room. The greed, the money, the possessions, the identity, the food, the drink, the sex, whatever it is that rules us. We submit it to you, dear Lord. He will come again. He will come again. And he'll take Until that day, as you go from this place, may be filled with his Holy Spirit in a way that you truly can be the presence of Christ in our community so that people will find the way back to him. You're dismissed.
looked at me and said, I count of you, you as a son. And for a second our eyes met, and I met that with a question. Do you know what you are getting yourself into? I'm getting into you, because you've got to me. I got to be your essential to survive. I'm gonna love you with my life. I've been a liar and I'll never rub mouth to the kind of person you deserve to worship you. You say you will not dwell on what I did, but rather what I do. You say I love you and that's what you are getting yourself into. Getting into you because you've got to me in a way words can't describe. I'm getting into you because I got to be your essential to survive. I'm gonna love you with my life. I'm getting into you because you've got to me in a way words can't describe. Cause I've got to be your essential to survive. I'm gonna love you with my life. You said I love you and that's what you are getting yourself into.